you don't really see Ubisoft doing platformers much these days. And I mean, like, yeah, I guess you could maybe argue that Assassin's Creed has platforming involved in some shape or form. Kinda, yeah, but the only thing that really falls under that entire genre from Ubisoft these days is Rayman. But Rayman wasn't the only cartoony platforming hero that came out of Ubisoft. Hot on the heels of the original Rayman success, it was pretty clear they needed a sequel. But while the original Rayman 2 was initially being conceived in 2D, there was interest in creating a 3D title that carried on that torch as well. Tonic Trouble was the scratch to that itch. I remember seeing ads for this thing a bunch as a kid, and all I could ever think was how much it just looked like a bootleg Rayman 2. But little did I know that it not only came out before Rayman 2, but it was even published by the same company. It was 3D Rayman before 3D Rayman. This game was in development back when Rayman 2 was still a 2D game, but after many delays, it ended up coming out only a couple of months before Rayman 2, so I guess it ended up being a sort of an appetizer for those that were excited for Rayman's first 3D adventure. The similarities were pretty hard to deny. Both were platformers featuring limbless heroes with bright and colorful fantasy worlds. I mean, like, Rayman was a game that was so damn unique, not a single other game in existence even came close to resembling it except Tonic Trouble. While it was not developed by the same team as Rayman, Michel Ancel, the creator of Rayman, was the one who conceptualized the game's world and characters, which explains why they both look so similar. Instead of being developed by Rayman's team, Ubisoft Montpellier, this would be developed by Ubisoft Montreal, even being their first major console game. I mean, these are the guys that we now know for making Far Cry, Watch Dogs, Assassin's Creed, you know, probably the single biggest subdivision of Ubisoft that exists now, but Back then, they were just fresh blood working on a little sister project to what the big boys at Ubisoft Montpellier were doing. It's kind of surreal to think at one point these were the little guys and they were the big guys because now it couldn't be any more opposite. I read on some wiki site that supposedly Tonic Trouble started as a game to test Rayman 2's engine, but I couldn't find any legitimate sources to back that claim up. That's kind of the problem with fan wikis is that they usually don't cite their sources. I think I even quoted that when I made my Rayman 2 video like forever ago, but the thing is back then I didn't think people would ever watch my videos, so I didn't really think to make sure the information was accurate. Oops. I think this tidbit is a little bit misleading since it implies that Tonic Trouble was created for the purpose of testing an engine when I imagine the reality is closer to this engine being made first for this game and then having Rayman 2 reuse it once the development of the 2D version was scrapped. Again, I don't know for sure. I did some research, but I couldn't find anything concrete. But regardless of the specific timeline of Tonic Trouble and Rayman 2's sibling development, Rayman 2 would go on to become one of the most beloved platformers of all freaking time. And and Tonic Trouble, nobody would remember it. Well, I guess I at least remember the marketing more than with Rayman. I mean, like, I think this drawing of the muscle man form was a little bit more memorable than what's better, Rayman or a man named Ray? What? But enough of Rayman. I'm sure if I treat this game as nothing more than a stepping stone into something much more important, I'm only going to overshadow what this thing was all about. So, uh, yeah, I've been really curious about this game ever since I was a kid, and this is going to be my first time playing it, so... Let's give it a shot. Well, that sure is a pretty lifeless title screen. Uh, it's just a static 2D image. There's not even any music either. I mean, it is well composed and full of character, I guess, but I think this would have worked better as like box art or something instead of a title screen. The story begins with a real-time cutscene of this space janitor named Ed cleaning up the wacky objects room. I don't know. <laughs> he decides to take a little sip of this magic tonic he sees on the shelf. <laughs> Ugh, that, didn't, that did not go well. The can then tumbles out of the ship and lands on Earth, where it spills into a river, enhancing the intelligence and physical evolution of the world's vegetables, turning them evil and bloodthirsty. Noticing how the tonic kind of did some crazy stuff, this Viking dude named Grog takes the tonic for himself so he can use it to try and take over the world. Stupid ass Ed's now gonna take responsibility for dumping that thing there, and he travels to Earth to try and fix everything. The sit rep is delivered via slideshow, which is an interesting 
choice, I guess. Uh, maybe it's supposed to be like Ed's mission debriefing or whatever, but I don't know, it kind of rubs me as lazy to just have these characters on a black background instead of having a real scene where it takes place. In the PC version, there's a pre-rendered cutscene, and this part is shown in an intergalactic courtroom where Ed's on trial for his crimes of stealing and losing a tonic. Uh, definitely much more interesting than this slideshow. Oh, that's the same general guy that sold uh, a razor beard the Grolgoth. I guess that was a little reference to tonic trouble this whole time. Kind of weird that he only appears in the PC version, though, because he's only in the CG version of the cutscene, uh, which is interesting because this game never got released on PlayStation. I'm sure they probably would have had these cutscenes in that version if it existed. Also, uh, apologies for the bad quality. I ripped the video from the disc itself directly, and it was kind of in 240p, so there's not really much I can do about that one. The PC version also has this really great bit where Ed almost gets the tonic right away. Uh, he crashes through Grog's hideout, but messes up and lands on a slope in the mountains. In the N64 version, it doesn't show exactly how he gets there. He just, quote-unquote, lands on Earth, and that's where we start the game. So, we start off by... Okay. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't make too many Rayman comparisons, but, like, it literally opens with a slide segment. That's the... Wow. <laughs> But again, this game came first, so for all we know, Rayman 2 might have borrowed that from here. There's quite a bit more to it than just careening down a linear tunnel, though. It's got jumps and ramps and items to collect on the way down. Honestly, I think it's a better opener, at least gameplay-wise. Not as iconic as a busting out of the pirate ship, but I found it more fun. And hey, would you look at that? The, uh, the man himself, the Rayman himself. Uh, that's pretty cool that, like, both games have a little nod to each other. So, once you land in the hub world, you're tasked with rescuing the professor. He'll be able to build you a device invention machine that can launch you into Grog's hideout. I really gotta say, the characters and animations in this game are excellent, super expressive. I particularly love how whenever Ed enters a portal to a new level, he gets sucked in piece by piece, and then it dumps them all out at once on the other side, then he assembles himself. There's some subtler details that are really great too, like Ed's reaction when you try to push a button you already pushed, he'll look back at the camera and shrug. And some of these death animations are pretty freaking wild. Kinda reminds me of Crash. I really love H and XYZ's character design, it takes the classic trope of a spy hiding behind a newspaper, and it turns the newspaper into the character. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, I like the way the game looks. Let's see if I like the way it plays. The controls are fairly simple. At the beginning, you don't have many more options than just running and jumping. You can't even attack at first, at least not in your base form. Ed can eat popcorn to turn himself into Super Ed! <laughs> in this state, you can whack enemies around and use your brute strength to separate bars blocking your path. Kinda weird that popcorn is what turns them super. Like, I figured it was gonna be the the tonic, but I guess that's totally out of reach now, so they just went with popcorn. Uh, with the theme of fruits and vegetables, you'd think it'd be something healthy, like an apple or something. Ah! That voice kind of sounds like Billy West. Super Ed! Oh, it is Billy West. Okay, yeah, I, I kind of figured because it sounds like Zap Brannigan. Speaking of voices, anything that comes out of Ed probably sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Hey! Yeah, that's David Gasman, the exact same guy that voices Rayman. I don't really think that was a very good move. Like, if they wanted this thing to stand uniquely from Rayman, they should have at least got a different voice actor. So not only does he look similar, he sounds the same too. I mean, when I heard him coming out of Rough Trigger, well, at least that character design was radically different, so it didn't have me thinking of Rayman all the time. What the hell is this? Oh, I see. I, okay, the tonic must have landed here too. All right, it all makes sense now. The game feel is a little weak, I guess I'd say. Uh, the running feels fine, but I really feel like the jump lacks oomph. There's no good sound effect or grunt for when you leave the ground, and the motion blur trailing effect that Ed emits is more distracting than it is cool looking. The game really needs a good huh for the jump, you know, a sound like that. There's a ledge grab, but it's a little bit finicky. I found the edge collision to be a little bit wonky sometimes. A lot of times it seems like the game couldn't decide to put me on the platform or to grab the edge of it, so briefly I would jitter into the side of it. You can jump out of the ledge grab though, which feels really good. I always felt like more games could use that. It really improves the flow of the acrobatics when you don't have to wait for a climbing animation and you can ascend again immediately. One big problem I had with the controls though was the camera. The C buttons barely do anything. It rotates at such a crawl and a lot of times it's straight up unresponsive. And could they have picked a more annoying sound for when the camera's locked? In games like Mario, or Rayman, or even Gex, it's a quieter and less intrusive sound that still communicates error or denial, so you're made aware of the fact that you can't perform that action at the moment, but it's able to do it without grating your eardrums. 
Oh my god, they really needed a less annoying sound for this. Though I did have a lot less problems with the camera once I gave up on the C buttons entirely and started relying only on using the Z button to center it behind myself, so if you play this game, please do yourself a favor, forget the C buttons exist, and just pretend the game has a Zelda camera. As you make your way through the game, you'll unlock more and more abilities for Ed, uh, one new one per stage completed. The first one's the staff you can use to attack. You'll finally be able to bust up those vegetables. I like these guys, these toasters of fire toast at you. That's pretty good. You can also use the staff as a lever, which is pretty cool, by uh, jamming it into a base and then cranking it left and right. This game's a little more puzzle focused, with less emphasis on combat, which I guess was a pretty good way of differentiating it from Rayman 2. I mean, this was a sister project after all. They don't want to just make two of the same game at the same time, right? I mean, that would just be outright ridiculous and an incredible waste of resources and time. Like, it would just be a really bad decision for uh, the company of Ubisoft to do something like that. Yeah. Other abilities include a blowgun you can use to fire off darts. I mean, what's an adventure game on N64 without some sort of projectile attack, right? Uh, you can use this to take out flying bad guys and hit switches and stuff. This section here made no sense to me. Uh, you gotta lower both parts of the bridge, and there's two targets, so of course I hit one target and the first bridge goes down, and I hit the other target and it goes back up. What you have to do is you have to hit the same target twice. It doesn't matter which one, just hit the same one twice and ignore the other one. This really seems like a mistake. If if it was, they didn't fix it in the PC version, I can say that much. And we've also got this gliding move that's... God, it's so unwieldy. The controls are really clunky. It's so hard to navigate the stage without crashing into something. I was able to sort of get a feel for it after a while, but man, this is just not good. So of course you'll have to use each new ability to enter each new level from the hub world, and I actually do kind of like this hub world. It's this forest area full of these winding pathways that lead to each different level, and if you don't have what you need, the professor's daughter will be there to tell you to come back later once you have it, so it's usually pretty clear on where you can and can't go at any given moment. I don't really like how certain segments of the hub world are sectioned off by these portals though. It made some chunks feel somewhat disconnected, and that made learning the layout of the hub world a little bit difficult at first. So the levels in question are all pretty linear, you'll use your moves to platform your way through them and solve some very basic puzzles. Some levels I definitely liked more than others, I thought some of these were a little bit underwhelming, but there are some here that I thought had some pretty good ideas. I really enjoyed the North Plane level, it has you riding a floating platform that gravitates towards whatever target you hit with the blowgun, but the temple level was easily my favorite. It's a bunch of little chambers full of these Indiana Jones style puzzles, and I really liked how the different rooms felt connected because of how they can interact with each other. Like right here, for example, you can drain the water and it moves from this room to the room underneath. At its worst, though, the game can be a little bit unclear on what to do. Uh, this level here has you pushing this big block into place, but there's no pushing animation. You kind of just walk into it and it clunkily moves along. It just doesn't feel very good. Oh god, this part was the worst for me. Uh, the game tells you to melt the ice, and you gotta do that to get up to the dude throwing stuff at you. So I see these flamethrowers, and I see a couple of buttons, and I think, okay, I'll activate the flamethrowers, and that'll melt the ice. But none of the buttons would do anything, and I ended up wandering around the stage for what seemed like 20 freaking minutes without any clear indication on how to progress. What it turns out you do is you have to wait for the guy to throw something at you when you're standing on this specific spot, and you have to hit it back at him. Like, how was I supposed to figure that out? I guess the game hints at it by pointing the camera in his direction when you stand here, but I still think that telling me to melt the ice was really misleading. The pacing also isn't really that good sometimes. Uh, one of the later levels just dumps puzzle after puzzle at you with nothing in between. But usually it has a good blend between puzzle and platforming, that's what it was like in the previous levels, but, but here it's like, okay, do this block puzzle, okay, now do the switch puzzle, okay, now do the sliding tile puzzle. It felt really excessive. A little quick tip for people that hate these kinds of puzzles, uh, hit the center, then the four corners in a circle, it does it every time, at least if you're given a completely blank slate to start with, that is. So the levels themselves are fine, I like some of them, others are just okay, but there's one little thing that makes them all annoying as hell to finish. The game's infatuation with collecting. See, the professor needs these materials to finish his invention machine thing, so you have to keep a lookout for the level-specific item each time, but you have to collect every single one to clear the level, and I swear, I swear, every single time, I would miss one of them, and I would have to backtrack throughout the entire stage to look for it. It seemed like once per level, there would always be that one out-of-the-way thing I would miss, even when I was trying to be as thorough as possible. Uh, the temple, for example. Like, how was anybody supposed 
supposed to know on their first run, there's a target underneath this platform. No matter how much I liked to stage, there would always be that awful moment where I'd get to the end and let out a big groan when I realized I didn't get everything. But the worst of it is the collect-a-thon quest at the very end. To enter the second last area, you have to collect 160 of the 180 collectibles, these little swirl things. They say they're antidotes, it's kind of a weird way of representing that, but whatever. Basically, the boss you have to find is in this poisonous mushroom area that you need a potion that'll make you immune to the poison. So the story reason is sound, but it's such a tedious and annoying process to go through, mostly because you can't get a lot of these on your first run through the stage. You'll have to return later with new abilities that'll let you get to the areas that hide them. And hey, I'm all for this idea. I do love returning to older areas with new abilities to find new areas, but the thing is, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. It works great in more open-ended games like Banjo and Zelda because you can just go to the area and walk right to the spot you need to, but in a linear game, you have to replay the level in a straight fashion to get to that area again, redoing everything a second time, resolving the puzzles, refighting the enemies, redoing the platforming. It's not just a matter of going to the area. And I think that's Tonic Trouble's biggest weakness, these two aspects of the collecting. It bogs down the pacing of an otherwise pretty okay game into something that's fairly monotonous. It's kind of a shame because, like, this is almost a good game. It's just held back by bad pacing and a lack of polish in a lot of areas. I like the stuff I said about the jump not feeling good, the wonky edge collision, the flying controls, and, of course, the camera. I guess if you're into older platformers, I'd say it's the presentation that makes the game worth playing. The characters are just incredibly entertaining to watch, and the world has that iconic Ansel flavor. It's lush and vibrant, and it's got those swirls and fantasy designs that are unique to a world envisioned by him. I really like the soundtrack too. I mean, again, it's super similar to Rayman 2's, even being composed by the same guy using the exact same sound font, but hey, he did a great job on that game and did a great job here too. I do like to try and recommend the best version of a game if I can, so I'd say the Windows version definitely has the edge here. Not only does it obviously run at a higher frame rate and resolution and has higher quality textures, but you also get that great opening FMV, and I found the edge detection to be strangely better here. The N64 version still runs pretty good though. It's not the smoothest running game in the system, but I never had any major issues with it, so if that's more your forte, it's not a bad option. Now there was one really strange, but really interesting thing about the PC version. Uh, what I have right here is the retail edition if you walked into a store and bought it. This would have been what you got, but this game was also bundled with certain graphics cards back in the day, and some people even say it was included in cereal boxes. Remember cereal box PC games? Uh, shout out Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, but uh, anyway, for that version of the game, they accidentally printed an older, unfinished build of the game that was barely freaking playable. This version is really different from the final release. The levels are all different, the hub is slightly different, there's different enemies. Look at the HUD, it's nothing like the final version. The opening cutscene's not even here, like you just hit start and you're already going down the hill. Imagine how confused you would be if this was the only version of the game you ever played. Most interesting about this build though is the controls. It's tank controls, god. Immediately I was having flashbacks from the most frustrating parts of Croc. Uh, this level here I straight up couldn't beat because the controls are so bad. And that's really interesting because I remember Michel Ansel said that Ubisoft originally wanted him to use tank controls in Rayman 2 because they were quote unquote popular. Some of the best selling games of the time, like Tomb Raider and Resident Evil, they all use tank controls. So some publishers were dead set on keeping it that way instead of innovating the same way that Mario 64 did. In their eyes, if it didn't have tank controls, it wasn't going to sell like the big boys that had tank controls. That's actually the entire reason Rascal at tank controls. John Burton, the game's director, wanted full analog like Mario, but in his case, the publisher had it their way and the game suffered for it. The camera and rendering system John developed just didn't work with tank controls and the game flopped. Luckily for Rayman though, and thank god for this, Michel won the fight against the publisher and the objectively better controls were made final. I can only imagine that must have influenced the development of Tonic Trouble as well. It must have, because we know for a fact from this beta version, the game game did originally have tank controls, and they suck ass. Publishers, please have more faith in your developers, because I'm sorry, but sometimes they know more than you. Let creatives be creative. Stop letting your sales figures be what dictates the quality of a game. Stop meddling with quality game design! Agent games deserve better! Games deserve better!
I guess it is pretty easy to look at this and write it off as an inferior version of Rayman 2, but similarities aside, I do think it does enough different to separate it from its bigger brother. The game was even gonna get a sequel, but it never came to fruition because Ubisoft just didn't have a whole lot of faith in the property. I mean, it got left in the dust while Rayman came out on top, so that doesn't really surprise me. I guess Ed's dead. Literally. I guess it would have been kind of cool to see a sequel to this, like they could have tweaked it to further differentiate it from Rayman while adding more and more to what the puzzles had to offer, but I'm not too upset that we never got a Tonic Trouble 2 because, I mean, firstly, we have the Rayman series, but secondly, it's average. It's an okay game that's kind of held back by some bad choices, but hey. At least it's better than what it was going to be with those tank controls, god. That's one thing about this project I do really appreciate, is that halfway through development, they took a step back, they reevaluated themselves, and they got with the times to make sure the game was much better than it was going to be. And in a world where certain games like Rascal are completely destroyed by the decisions of the publisher, that's a really important thing. Yo, welcome to the end of the video, uh, thanks so much for watching the whole thing. Uh, if you're here, remember to click that like button and subscribe to my butthole. Uh, I got a Patreon if you're interested in podcasts, Brady and me do a podcast, it's only a dollar a month. Uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, thanks for watching, I love you guys, and I'll see you guys again sometime soon.